Well, uh, first, thank you uh, for coming out. Um, good afternoon. I want to thank uh, Dean Manning for uh, and Dean Sealing for inviting me here and for the introduction. Um, uh, I'm from Harrisburg. Uh, in fact, I was telling uh, Dean Sealing that uh, my mother uh, received a uh, paralegal degree here from, uh, in the 90s, uh, sometime around 1997, 1998 or so. Uh, so there is a connection between all of us. Um, uh, I also have to admit that I was honored a few weeks ago when I received a phone call in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, and Dean Sealing had asked me if I would come here and give a talk about the research I had done on Harrisburg, uh, which I'm happy to do. Uh, but I have to admit that I'd be remiss if that's all I did, because I think events like these uh, on or surrounding uh, Martin Luther King Day should honor the legacy of, of Dr. Martin Luther King. So what I'm going to try to do today is, is find the parallels among many decades of history uh, and the lives of uh, two men, uh, Martin Luther King and who my most recent book is about, uh, William Howard Day. Now, in, in doing that also, the issue that I'd like to tackle uh, in the time that I have here is uh, over the origins or the genesis of uh, the Civil Rights Movement and leadership in that movement. Um, Martin, William, and I think all of us, you know, Martin Luther King, William Howard Day, and, 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 and Everyone's sitting in this room and how we can take a look at the lives of these two men and use those to teach us how to be leaders in whatever facet of our lives is necessary. Um, life uh, seems to have a, a persistent um, trend of good and bad or of life and death. And if that's the constant trend of things being born, then living and ultimately dying, uh, then I think there's an infinite trend of uh, struggles and successes. And because of that, whether you talk about the 19th century or the 20th century or now the 20th, 21st, I think because of that infinite cycle, we're always, we'll always be in the need of leaders. William Howard Day being from the 19th, Dr. Martin Luther King being from the 20th, and all of us here living in the 21st. Um, I'm a great admirer of, of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, he was both the leader and a, uh, a symbol of a, of a movement. Um, he spoke for those who couldn't. He marched for those who weren't quite brave enough. Um, and ultimately, uh, he took a bullet for everyone who wanted equality. You know, when I teach and I study Martin Luther King, I often think of three things. Um, you know, one of those is that the fact that he was a transformative figure. Uh, he transformed people. Um, through his actions in his heart. Uh, he understood that there's a difference between success and greatness. Uh, success is often lonely, uh, even idolatrous. Uh, it's without love, it's without compassion. Um, uh, whereas greatness, yeah, if, if one is great, you know, typically they, they understand that uh, uh, they must put aside personal accolades or, or successes or accomplishments for the well-being of other people. I mean, when Dr. King died, he didn't have enough money to provide health insurance for his family. He was broke. You know, when William Howard Day died, uh, he had $400 that had just been uh, donated to him by members of his church. Uh, and you can look at other people that were involved in the civil rights movement who we can consider you know, great to take a look at someone like Malcolm X who had $150 in his pocket the day he was killed. You now that's greatness. Um, Dr. King's actions taught me what real character is. You know, he spoke about character in his I Have a Dream speech. Um, you know, he, he comments that uh, he had a dream that on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would be able to sit down at the table of brotherhood. Uh, he didn't end with that. He talked about in Alabama where little black boys and black girls can join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. How that reminds me of my childhood, uh, whether it was picking on my little sister or being bullied by my older brother. You know, we sometimes didn't like each other. We complained. Uh, we squealed on each other to our parents, got in fights. You know, but come the end of the night, I think we still loved one another. You know, and, and I would run through a wall for my brother, and my sister would take a bullet for me. Um, and I think that's a lesson and the message of, of many of Dr. King's addresses. And I, I think finally, uh, Dr. King, his words 
uh, taught me um, about brotherhood um, and, and many other messages. Uh, you know, his Dr. King's March on Washington um, was his signature. Uh, he uh, gave a speech on August uh, 28th, 1963. Um, about 200,000 marchers walked with him, both black and white. Uh, and what is considered to be the largest civil rights demonstration in, in American history. Uh, there were other speakers there, A. Philip Randolph, um, John Lewis, and obviously Dr. King. And their speeches were supposed to address the, uh, how President Kennedy and the federal government were dragging their feet over economic equality. You know, even John Lewis, who then was a young 23, 24-year-old uh, chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, had parts of his speech censored because it was considered too inflammatory. And Dr. King actually, his speech was called the promissory note speech, not I have a dream, which many of you are probably more familiar with. But he spoke about a promissory note um, and how the government owed a debt. Uh, in his speech, he says, 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro still lives on a lonely island of poverty, or poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. And 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. Uh, here he compares Jim Crow to manacles and chains. He compares the economic condition of African Americans in the country to a man living in exile. He says more. Uh, in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our great republic wrote the magnificent words in both the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was the fall heir. Now, here he talks about a promissory note, which in banking is a reference to um, a certain sum of money that's promised from one party uh, to the next. For him, it was a metaphor. Uh, he's Dr. King claimed that the Founding Fathers, who wrote our original parchments, uh, promised equality from one party to the next. Now he continues, uh, this note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note. America has given the Negro people a bad check and a check that has come back marked insufficient funds. Now, Martin Luther King here is threatening the government with a revolution, albeit peaceful, but a revolution, you know, which many movements of today I echo that. Um, when Dr. King died, he was considered by the FBI as the most dangerous African American in the country. Um, there are many lessons from this story. However, it's important to note that there was a time before the promissory note speech, and there was a time before the March on Washington before the boycott in Montgomery, or the violence in Selma. You know, and before the, the uh, uh, tear gas or police dogs, there was once a generation of leaders who held that baton. And that's mainly what I want to talk about. Um, when Dr. King spoke those words in, in, in Washington in 1963, many people consider that the first civil rights demonstration in, in our history, on our nation's capital. But what people don't know is actually 98 years earlier, there was the first Civil Rights March on Washington that people in the historical world have simply omitted from history. Um, on July 4th, 1865, uh, William Howard Day and about 10 to 15,000 newly freed persons paraded around the nation's capital and ultimately convened on the backyard of the Andrew Johnson White House. And using the, 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 the president's home as his backdrop, William Howard Day uh, challenged African Americans to put pressure on the government for universal equality, namely education and suffrage. William Howard Day is, is arguably, and definitely in my opinion, uh, the most significant, but yet also the most marginalized hero of the 19th century. Easily, uh, we could be celebrating a Martin Luther, or I'm sorry, William Howard Day commemoration today as much as we do with uh, Dr. King. Uh, people in this area most know William Howard Day because there's a housing development 
um, and a cemetery which both bear his name. Um, one in, uh, in the outskirts of the city, uh, uh, the housing development and the cemetery being located in Steel. Um, uh, he lived in Harrisburg the last 29 years of his life, um, uh, having moved here in 1871. He served on the Harrisburg City School Board for six terms. Uh, two and a half years uh, of that service was spent as the Harrisburg um, City School Board President. Uh, at the time he served those positions in, in, the, uh, in the 1890s, he was the first and the only African American School Board President in the country. Um, uh, he was involved in registering black voters in the city. Um, he, was he was greatly involved in the AME Church in the city. 